I am Pierce. This is Ace Meg. That's Goldie in the far corner over there. And uh, our special guest is Sanity Bit. You could also say my name is a smig, sort of a like smig. you're sneezing, you know. Okay. Uh, a smig. It, okay. That works pretty well. Just saying. So who here uses internet? <laughs> Yay. Uh, a basic overview of the technology. Um, WiMAX is fast wireless internet. Um, it's the 802.16 protocol, which is sort of similar to the 802.11 protocol. And it's especially interesting because it is under IEEE control. It's very different from a lot of the other mobile wireless specs that are under control of different um, mobile companies and things like uh, L LTE is the 4G technology that was come up with by the cell phone industry. And it's another high speed wireless internet system and currently with WiMAX there is a large nationwide network being developed and deployed by Clearwire and it is branded under the name Clear and a lot of people have probably seen it or commercials. Get closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Yeah, light the mic. Okay. How did we hear the lips? God damn it. Yeah. So. <laughs> So in the U.S. there are a couple of WiMAX networks. Um, the largest one, however, is Clear. Um, founded originally as Clearwire, they provided proprietary uh, wireless internet from Motorola called Expedience, and then later on um, bought up a lot of 2.5 gigahertz spectrum and started providing uh, 802.16 uh, WiMAX over that network. Um, they're currently deployed in 79 markets across 21 states. Um, and they have a very aggressive rollout plan. They're hoping to hit all major U.S. markets by the end of 2012. Uh, in the next three months alone, they're planning on hitting another 22 markets, including uh, New York, Miami, San Francisco. They also just opened up in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, they're really aggressively rolled out in Texas right now. Um, there are actually a couple of their services using Clear's network, and these are all investors in Clear's in initial infrastructure. Um, it's Time Warner Cable, uh, selling it, rebranded as Roadrunner Mobile. Comcast, selling it as com uh, high Comcast High Speed to Go. And Sprint, which is one of the larger investors in Clear, which is using it for their 4G service uh, with their uh, HTC Evo. Um, they're all placed onto the same physical network. There's no difference on the infrastructure, as you can see in this screenshot all of the signal are the same, it's the same tower. The only difference is what portal pages that are uh, company specific you get redirected to when you get on. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So this is, this is, a, this is a map. Uh, the gray stuff is uh, a couple of the markets that they're opening. It's not showing all of them because of the zoom coverage. Um, and uh, they're, they're in a lot of major markets, including Las Vegas. Okay. So last year we discussed uh, a couple of ways to bypass their portal page, and uh, apparently they were listening because they kind of tried to put a little plug in it. So last year uh, we told you that you use op OpenVPN over UDP port 53 and it just blasts right through the portal page. So uh, their fix to that problem was, was they blocked large UDP packets from exiting the network on port 53. Uh, the counter fix to that was we just fragmented the packets to make them a little bit smaller. <laughs> it works great. Um, you just have to add two options to your OpenVPN config file, and that's pretty much all she wrote. Next so, next slide. So that's uh, an example OpenVPN config file right there. And uh, anyone who's configured or played with OpenVPN, you already know how easy it is to get that set up, and you just got to add those two options, and you can go right through the portal page from the service providers. So. Going into some of the hardware now, this is a picture of some Echo Peak hardware, which is WiMAX gear from Intel. 
the interesting stuff about this is that it works in Linux, unlike a lot of the more consumer grade WiMAX gear. A lot of the WiMAX stuff that you buy at the store is for consumers and these come in a lot of, I guess some of the newer ThinkPads and there are some companies that are selling laptops that have these built in. They're tiny PCIe cards and you can actually buy them on eBay for about $80 now. Um, the 5150 and the 5350 are the best supported in Linux and you go to linuxwimax.org and you can download the, uh, the network tools and all that and the version 1.4 is what you're looking for with the current version of Ubuntu and it actually has the firmware and the kernel drivers already installed, it just doesn't have the tools to connect to the network. Um, if you want to use these in an actual computer, you pretty much need to buy the USB PCIe cradle and those are about forty dollars that you can get them online. The PCIe cards, if you plug them into laptops, they typically don't work. The wireless part will work because this is actually 802.11 and 802.16 on this card. The 802.11 will work fine in any computer but the 802.16 is not, we, we figure that it's not powered high enough or there's some weird issue where it's like newer PCIe buses are required um, but it hasn't worked in any of the laptops that we've tested even though there have been some think pads and stuff that we've seen that it will work on. Good morning. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, I wasn't sure if anybody was actually awake this early on Sunday. This is my first time to DEF CON. No, it isn't. Um, <laughs> but I got the impression that people would be partying late last night and have a hard time rolling out of bed this morning. So anyway, again, my name is Asmig, Achu Asmig, just like that. I'm talking about hardware hacking a little bit. I don't really know much about it, I'm just getting started, but I've had some fun with it so far. And so what we're looking at right now is the Motorola CPE 150 and 750 devices. It's also known as the home router, sort of like a uh, cable modem, but no wires. It's kind of cool. Um, it says down there, got root. And, and do you? Well, you could. They are running Linux. So inside, 64 megs of RAM, 32 megs of flash, has a Basim wireless chipset, kind of cool. It's a Texas Instruments TNET V1061 at 213 megahertz. Pretty awesome stuff there. Very speedy. It's a MIPS 32 core. Um, so if you want to know what your instruction set is, there it is. MIPS 32, pretty easy. The debugging is via JTAG, um, EJTAG in specific, and uh, so it's all nice standard stuff. But I didn't know how to use any of that stuff, so I had to like learn from scratch. It's kind of fun though, um, and yeah, it is actually running Linux. We weren't sure at first. We thought it was probably Linux, but you know, didn't see any source floating around, so weren't sure until we pulled some some uh, some firmware dumps. So um, when you're looking at a device like those, oh, there they are, um, what do you do to figure out what it's actually running? I mean, does anybody have any thoughts? Take it apart. Take it apart, exactly. And then what? Burn it. Burn it. <laughs> yeah? Because it's crap. It, it, well, okay, sure. Yeah, looking at those specs, I might say that too. You know, pull off the RAM and chuck the rest. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Serial console. Serial console. Good. Where do you find it though? Oscope. Oscope. Yeah. I wish I knew how to use one of those. That'd be cool. Uh, so um, here's my trick. This is a, a logic probe and uh, it's kind of like my little magic wand. I'd be waving it around right now except that I left it in my hotel room. Eh, sorry. It's pretty cool. I mean, all you have to do is you find the negative, you find the positive, and you clip those little leads, the, the color coded ones, you know, the red one for positive, the black one for, for negative. Really complicated stuff. Like, took me ages to figure that one out. And then there's the pointy bit, and you just like stab at the device randomly until something happens. It's like, I thought it was pretty cool. I, I don't know. So eventually, what I found is that if you put it on this one pad and then you plug in the device, then all of a sudden the red and green light on this thing would just light up like a Christmas tree. I was like, oh, awesome. Hey, that's doing something. And it was right next to, you know, a couple other pads. Seems like maybe that was serial. So, sure enough, I found the serial port. 
and you know, I was poking around a little bit more. I also labeled the processor, flash, RAM, piece one, you know, just in case. I actually had to solder the headers on myself, um, and uh, they are surface mount headers, so they're, they're kind of a hassle. Um, you've actually all seen them if you've seen the DEF CON badge this year, which I hope you have. If you're in this room and you haven't seen the DEF CON badge, get the hell out. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that uh, JTAG connector is actually the exact same connector as used on the, the DEF CON badge this year. And the serial connector is a little bit different, but pretty close. So how do you talk to the JTAG? Well, I stole this from the internet and uh, if alec at sensi.org is here, thank you for this fine schematic. It, it came in handy. I built this thing out of it and it actually worked. <laughs> Nobody else is surprised? I'm freaking surprised. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it gave me stuff like this. Now I know you can't actually read that. You're not supposed to be able to read that. This is like the token slide. You know, everybody has a, a presentation with a slide that has so much crap in it you can't actually read it. Well, this is that one. Except that the people that are right next to the projectors might see something in the bottom two lines that looks interesting. Anybody just like shout that out? Yeah, yeah, console state locked. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. Well, okay. So it also has some other information in there that seems pretty handy. It talks about where the bootloader it is. It talks about where the different images are, the configurations, the certificates for the device. Yeah, X509 certificate. That's pretty cool. And uh, factory defaults. Also, this JFFS2. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, cool. Well, for those of you who don't know, that's a partition where you can actually read and write data. Um, it's pretty, pretty fancy for Flash, anyway. So what about the root? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this device, it can be rooted. Um, I did it the worst possible way. Okay, so this way works, but it sucks. And, and I know that it sucks now because I've, I've actually gotten into the device and been able to play with it. But for a first approach, you know, it got the job done. And my approach was, well, let's just jump back a couple slides. So in the bootloader, um, we saw that that information that had the, the console state locked and all that stuff. And that's actually the default bootloader configuration that gets dropped into the bootloader config area. So if you take the bootloader config area and you delete it, then it reloads from the bootloader area. And you can easily modify the bootloader config default, have it regenerate a new bootloader config, and then let it boot up. Um, but the problem is once it boots up a little ways, then this fancy program runs. And what it does, uh, according to the strings here, is basically it says, oh, did the console state somehow magically get set to unlocked? We don't want that. And it resets it to locked. So that's kind of a hassle. So my workaround for that was to reset it to unlocked, boot part of the way, freeze it, reset it back to locked so that it doesn't change anything, and then let it finish booting. Yeah, a little trickery, you know. I have JTAG control, so I can control the, the operation, and I don't, I don't really know how that stuff works. So, I'm taking a poor man's approach, and hey, it got the job done. Then I found that there's some uh, interesting stuff with this file uh, that's being called from that that previous script, and, and it turns out that as long as this file exists, then that that previous program doesn't actually do this relocking thing, and that makes it really handy to continue having root on the device once you get it. So basically all you'd have to do is just drop in this file as soon as you've got access to the thing and then you can reboot it and you've got complete access for as long as you want. It enables SSH so you can SSH into it with a default user pass which is pretty cool. Uh, and this file even gets executed so if you have anything that you want to have run every time you boot up the device like um, uh, killing SNMPD or uh, changing your firewall rules or, you know, changing passwords so that you're not using default everything for everything, eh, you know, it's a handy place to do that. So once you have root, you can go ahead and enable SSH um, and then you can SSH into the device with a default login of admin and password tools. <laughs> It drops you into a debug command line, which you can drop out of with the type in shell, which then drops us 